Excellent. Thank you very much, Ben. Well, good afternoon. And as Ben said, we're here to talk about um, accessibility related appraisal objectives, which is a, a piece of work that we have recently started at the University of Southampton. So I'm Tamsin Smith. I'm senior learning designer team lead at the University of Southampton. And I'm joined by Matthew Depros, who's a senior learning designer. So over to you, Matt. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting us to join you today on Global Accessibility Awareness Day. As Christian Bale says in the film, Terminator Salvation. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. It often feels that those of us with an interest in accessibility are part of a resistance aiming to reduce and remove inaccessible practices and unnecessary barriers that prevent people from making the most out of the potential of our digital estate. No doubt many of you have experienced advocacy fatigue, pointing out simple issues like focus indicators, focus order, colour contrast, alternative text, for the umpteenth time can wear you down. But we want to move from resistance into the mainstream. We want everyone to care and be interested. And we want considering accessibility to become second nature. In this session, we're going to talk a little more about this context. We appreciate that our presentation may be of more interest to the accessibility geeks among us. So we're going to use this context section to try to give some pointers to useful resources for those new to this area and then share our early thinking of an idea we're developing, aiming to embed accessibility more into the culture of our IT department through creating accessibility related appraisal objectives for a variety of roles. And then talk about some next steps, share with you the work we've done so far and invite you to share feedback and build on this early work. Uh, the slide deck, links and resources that we cover in this session are online and we'll be pasting this in the chat and maybe Tamsin will be kind enough to paste that link in for me but it's also um, if you scroll up in the chat you should see it there as well if, it, if, uh, if you can see the chat history. How every institution is at some point in its accessibility journey. We work in the University of Southampton IT department and to give you an idea of where we are at, whilst we don't have an IT accessibility policy, accessibility conformance is part of our non-functional requirements for procurement of new services. We have accessibility knowledge and skill as requirements for developer roles. We don't have accessibility testing as part of our change and release process and are not measuring nor reporting on accessibility. We have a fairly well established accessibility community of practice, but we don't have an established accessibility testing process, nor training specific to different types of role. We do have buy-in for accessibility from our leadership group to some extent at least. So what does that look like for us in our IT department? First, we can only talk from our own experiences and what we see, but on the positive side, we have seen our internal digital accessibility community of practice grow to include about 20% of our department as members. And through introducing Blackboard Ally in the educational context, we've raised awareness of accessibility further, even within our own IT department. And we find ourselves receiving ad hoc requests and inquiries relating to accessibility, showing that some are realizing this needs to be considered of course, it's coming towards like that proofing stage rather than shifting left to the initial requirements and design stages. On the other side, without checking for accessibility as part of our change and release process, new IT services are being launched with accessibility issues that are not logged or prioritized, building accessibility debt that will have to be paid off later with interest. And like many institutions, we received our letter from the Central Digital and Data Office for not meeting our responsibilities under the accessibility regulations. 
And whilst a lot of the issues identified were already on the roadmap for improvements to our corporate site, thanks to a massive transformation project led by our colleague Ayala Gordon, we had hoped it would start a wider conversation in our IT department about how to avoid introducing such issues across our whole digital offering. And for the moment, it seems that very few in our department are aware that the government has contacted us about this. And we need to acknowledge initiative fatigue. Our colleagues have been through a lot over the few, last few years. Now we have new strategies, new initiatives, and the same amount of time to get everything done. And telling people, here's more work you've not got time for, is not going to go down well, however well intended. But on the topic of more work, I always like to refer to this tweet. Accessibility isn't more work, you were just cutting corners before. The work was incomplete. This is particularly relevant for a professional IT department. You might hear people in the accessibility community talk about sustaining accessibility. It's the fourth point on the planning and managing web accessibility pathway from the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. Here, sustaining accessibility is about maintaining the momentum of our accessibility efforts. Looking at another framework, Lillian Joy at the University of York has done some brilliant work demonstrating how Cotter's eight steps can be used as a framework for shifting digital accessibility practice. The last of, the, of these steps is about anchoring changes in corporate culture. So embedding a change in departmental culture is obviously really important. If you'd like to learn more about Lillian's work, you can watch her presentation to the JISC accessibility community in a recorded webinar and read more about it on the University of York website. Continuing our thoughts about culture, Craig Abbott from the Department of Work and Pensions has recently published a blog post sharing his three pillars of accessibility. He writes that there are three core parts, compliance, education and culture. If you lack any of these three things over a sustained period of time, the strategy is unsustainable and your ability to consistently deliver accessibility services or accessible services will burn out. That mirrors Cotter's eighth step. And on the topic of the DWP, it's worth looking over their accessibility manual, which is a really useful resource. They have a section that relates accessibility to different job roles, which also aligns with some of the work we'll be talking about shortly. Back to the context. Now, as George mentioned on Monday's session, accessibility skills are in demand. Well, Teach Access found that very few university tech programs include accessibility, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology did research that found that 63% of tech companies were unable to staff their accessibility needs, and 93% expected that demand for accessibility skills would increase. Last year, the Wall Street Journal wrote that accessibility job listings had increased by 78%. So accessibility skills are in high demand. Universities tend to have a lower turnout than the private sector, but we will face the need to keep up that pipeline of maintaining staff with good knowledge of accessibility, which again will reflect into our organisational culture. On that topic, there's some resources to be aware of. Teach Access provides an accessibility skills hiring toolkit and Scott O'Hara has created a list of accessibility interview questions for different types of roles. The W3C provide a framework for building your own accessibility training courses and Teach Access has a tutorial aimed at developers that cover some of the basics. For generalists, Microsoft have created an accessibility fundamentals learning path and Hector Minto from Microsoft has a very practical LinkedIn learning course about accessibility in the modern workplace. For educators, LexDIS has a very useful online course for inclusive teaching and learning strategies. We need to reach out across our IT organisation to build that culture and awareness. And I'm sure many of you will have encountered colleagues thinking accessibility is about identity management and service access. It's a recurrent theme in our department to explain what we mean by, access by accessibility. For example, a database manager recently told us, my job is to make things as inaccessible as possible. 
and in discussions with our communication platforms manager, he said it, he hadn't ever tested the corporate site platform for which his team is responsible with a keyboard. So when we talk about sustaining accessibility, we're thinking about how to keep momentum. Even without a formal accessibility policy uh, that we have that we are missing at the moment for us, for ourselves, we can increment further by building an organizational culture that considers accessibility. So what opportunities are there each year? Most institutions are likely to run annual performance reviews with staff reflecting on the past year's outcomes and setting objectives for the year ahead. You might call these appraisals, personal development reviews or something else. Now, typically no one enjoys writing objectives. So what if we could give people some ready made objectives designed to raise awareness and understanding of accessibility in the IT department and helping to create that organisational culture? IT departments have particular attributes. They are responsible for most, if not all, of the university's digital estate. So implementing technical solutions that meet accessibility guidelines can only really be done by the IT department. They tend to be embedded within their institution, touching almost all aspects and are often looked to for leadership. We're based in our IT department, but these principles can be applied elsewhere as well. So the idea is to create a bank of accessibility related appraisal objectives that can be used as is or customised and are appropriate for different types of role. We've, we've been focusing on generalist developers and system support roles and at different levels of accessibility awareness and skill suitable for whatever stage an individual is at. Ultimately, aiming at steering towards the partnership level of maturity identified in the McNaught AbilityNet Accessibility Maturity Model. So we've broken them into different types of IT role. First, those that apply for any role, so universal or generalist. Then developers will have certain responsibilities for accessibility and also have knowledge of accessibility as a requirement in their job descriptions. So we need something for them. We have a large number of application support specialists who are answering tickets, planning upgrades, writing documentation and so on. They're also responsible for roadmaps for services. So we need to consider something for them. And then there are other roles like business analysts, project managers and so on, who may be dealing with vendors, planning out projects, and they might have a small number of objectives specific to certain other roles. And then we have four levels or stages. So we start at general awareness, moving on to discovering, focusing more on applying knowledge, building skill and exploring potential for improving accessibility within a colleague's area of influence. Then moving on to exploring, aiming for a deeper understanding of accessibility and its potential application and asking colleagues to collaborate with users with impairments and disabilities. And then finally moving on to advocating or championing. So by the way, um, the American company Intuit has an accessibility champion program that also has four levels. If you haven't come across it before, we recommend Ted Drake's blog post that explains how it works. He lists lots of different tasks for those at each level and there's lots of great ideas in his blog post. So here are some examples of different types of high level activity included in these objectives. And we've, we've mixed in objectives for different role types. So at the first level of general awareness, we have basic training. We have a generic training resource and links to further content on LinkedIn Learning and Microsoft Learn, as well as those resources from Teach Access and Lexdis that Matt mentioned earlier. Um, we've got reviewing vol vendor voluntary product assessment templates or VPATs and accessibility roadmaps or local accessibility statements. So to find out how what you learn in the abstract applies directly within the services you support and observing how your team culture, for example, online or hybrid meetings, reflect inclusive practices and suggesting improvements. As you learn some of these basics, it might be interesting to see how they apply in activities like team meetings. Then at the discovering level, you might be learning how to run simple accessibility tests, perhaps based on the W3C's quick checks or creating or reviewing an accessibility statement. I know we have hundreds of statements that need writing and Ben at UCL is doing some interesting work on making this process easier. 
um, or accessibility can be really daunting when you're new to it. So prioritising accessibility defects can be a good way to identify what's important to fix first and perhaps to start thinking about how to avoid such issues in the first place. Um, the Agile Accessibility Handbook has an excellent methodology for prioritising accessibility defects. Then moving on to the exploring level. So working with service users who have an impairment or disability, this could be in terms of understanding current issues, consulting on new developments, or learning about assistive technology use or examples of barriers that they face. For developers, refactoring a component to fix or improve accessibility issues whilst maintaining functionality should lead to learning opportunities for understanding better how such issues were introduced in the first place and lead to thinking about stopping them from reoccurring. And then finally, for advocating or championing, we're thinking about moving beyond the team level and talking to others, perhaps even outside the institution. So um, we, I mentioned the Agile Accessibility Handbook in the last slide. If you've not read this book, it's a very practical guide to implementing accessibility within an IT department. It's less than 100 pages and the electronic version is available free of charge. So I think Matt has just posted that in the chat. So the structure of our draft document has got four parts. A title, so we've only been sharing some example titles so far. Then the category aims to match with one of the three categories for appraisal objectives within our HR system. Then the description is meant to be a smart objective, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time boxed. And then lastly, what you might do to achieve this, which is more open and suggestive. So far, it's been difficult to differentiate the description and the what you might do section, so we may revise those. The idea is not just to do the activity, but to do it for a reason and having the outcome feedback into the team or department in some way, hopefully then building a virtuous circle. For example, discussing a service your team supports with a user who has a disability or impairment in order to identify work, what works well or not so well, and then gain a better understanding of the types of barriers the user faces with an outcome of developing an action plan to improve the user experience and discuss that with the team, business owner or user community. So, your turn. We're going to pause and give you the opportunity to take part. In the next three minutes, why not think of an example action using this template? First, you will describe a role and a level of accessibility awareness. Then you'll suggest an action and describe its outcome and then add in how it will feed into a team activity. So I have an example. As a person wanting general accessibility awareness, I will turn on accessibility checking in Microsoft products in order to identify and resolve issues as I work. And then with my team, we will share experiences, lessons and tips. So. We'll give you three minutes. Please post your suggestions in the chat. And even if you don't have time to finish, keep a note of what you've done because we're going to return to it later. And while you work on this, we'll check if there's any questions in the chat. Um, so we'll just have a look and, and see if there is anything that's there. Brilliant. Thanks, Tamsin. So everyone, hopefully you've got an idea of, of what we're asking for you. I'm going to start a time and give you three minutes um, of, of time, but we'll, we will be kind of burbling on in the background perhaps anyway uh, if you stuck for time or you just uh, don't can't think of anything now just keep this in mind because you can we'll tell you how you can work with us on this later so I'm just going to start my timer for three minutes and now let's just have a look uh, through the through the chat so let's see uh, Ben said it looks like we've been reading his mind which is uh, fantastic and um, I hope not just that you were thinking that we're in the apocalypse uh, trying to <laughs> make our way through a, a, a world controlled by machines, but but that but in more in terms of the uh, oh, of the feeling of, of the um, of being part of a resistance and trying to make things yeah. things better. And I'll just continue just checking out the uh, what was in the chat. So Ben, again, thanks for contributing. You mentioned that 
someone very senior in a large public sector body in the past said accessibility means making stuff available on your website 24 7 doesn't it and then mike added it does but we need to add that for everyone which is uh, incredibly relevant of course and i think that um we've uh, exhausted what was in the chat but um, ben, it's up to you and I to fill in the, and with Tamsin to fill in the next two minutes. Well, hopefully some of our attendees are, are, are making some notes of some of these I, of, of some of these ideas as a and then role and level of accessibility knowledge. I will so think of an activity in order to so to achieve some kind of outcome. And then with my team, we're going to then feed in and use that information in some way. So, sorry I interrupted you, Ben. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say I'm very happy. I, I had a quick go. I, I was completely inspired by this, and I, I, I thought I'd. I, it, would it be good for me to share that now as a quick example? Yeah, See go for it. Right. Yeah. Um, so, as an academic, I will always wear a microphone in order to ensure captions are as accurate as possible. And then with my team, we will share the outcomes of this to encourage other people to do the same. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's it's, really good. It's one of the, the things that always comes up. So it's very near to my heart, that one. Um, oh, oh, we've got a lovely example there from Claire as well. Thank you, Claire. Um, as a college disability tutor, I will turn on an alert encouraging students and staff struggling with digital accessibility to outline what they're struggling with in order to understand what the challenges we need to tackle are. And then with my team, we will tackle as many things as we can to improve this. Brilliant. So, thank Brilliant. you, Claire. And then I would love to say as a, as a partially deaf academic, I wish so many more people would wear a microphone because it can be really tough. So that's a great, a great goal. Thank you. I, I, I think, you know, because there's all, all lots of talk about captions and the the kind of time pressures of, of correcting captions. And I, I think, you know, that's for institutions to discuss about where the responsibility for that ultimately should reside. But I think getting people to meet people halfway by wearing a microphone, not turning their back, explaining acronyms they're using, repeating questions from audience members. There are so many things that can improve the chances that the automatic speech recognition has. So I think things like this and building it into kind of appraisals is just brilliant because I think there is definitely a initiative fatigue, a bit possibly like there was with GDPR. Everyone got very excited about it for a time and then the deadline came and it, it seemed to fall off a cliff a little bit. Um, so I'd hate that to happen here. And I think setting goals that people have to achieve year on year as part of their appraisal kind of makes it, I don't know, a bit more meaningful, doesn't it? And therefore it's not just the people who are interested, the people who are the accessibility people doing this. It's kind of everyone's responsibility. And I, I love that. Great point. And Mike's pointed out that with the move, back to the classroom, that's meant a lot of people have experienced a loss of sound quality and captions, or I've even heard some people just stop recording their lectures because they don't see it as a priority or something they need to do now that uh, supposedly things are back to normal, which is uh, quite disappointing. And again, having an institutional um, policy or perhaps even taking that decision away and just automating that the recordings will start at, at this timetable slot and so on. But I know there's challenges with those uh, with those types of things as well. And Mike's also suggested that accessibility should be part of promotion criteria. And yeah, I think that's that's very relevant as well. Um, could, could I say, I yes. think it should also be part of um teaching excellence frameworks. I can't believe that you can get gold for something and you're not necessarily providing for all of your students. I think that's, you know, and I think this model, we, we could absolutely um, share more widely and seek to get this built in, yeah, definitely to promotions, but definitely into things like the TEF as well as a, you know, that, that would get vice chancellors interested, I imagine. Mm, definitely, and our brilliant colleague, Sarah, from the education team at, or the education department at the University of Southampton has put one in. As an academic, I will introduce VPAPs, um, that's voluntary product uh, accessibility templates, as a tool to 
to colleagues in research in order to promote inclusive digital procurement for research, conferencing, etc. And then with my team, I will evaluate progress and challenges, pinch points, and some great chat coming in that I just had to, just scrolled away from my eyes. So, and then with my team, I will evaluate progress and challenges slash pinch points to build on this knowledge. That's uh, fantastic. And, and Ben, you, uh, do you want to talk about what Meta had said at the um, on Monday at the going about the going back is not a choice launch? Well, just the, you know, going back to Mike's point about this this worrying kind of rollback to physical modes of delivery and and seemingly forgetting all of the brilliant stuff we learned during the, the pandemic and all the pro progress we made. The one tiny ray of light, well, huge ray of light from a really awful experience was we made some really excellent progress and and not just for people with disabilities i, I think universally for, for everyone in terms of you know uh home working and just being able to access learning with with a choice and i think it's such a shame if we switch off some of the things that gave that choice to people so it was just a reminder that meta who's behind the uh, disabled students uk report um spoke earlier this week very powerfully about that and the impact of that and i think that's um for anyone who wasn't able to see that please please check back the recording and read the report because it's um it makes that case very powerfully why we mustn't switch that stuff off definitely definitely and one last one before we will carry on with the presentation but alison has written as a learning designer i will use the accessibility checker when creating office 365 materials in order to highlight anything I may have missed. And then with my team, I will ask for suggestions of fixes to the things I don't understand. And one thing, um, earlier today, I gave a presentation about writing alternative text for complex graphs and, and images. And just through learning about that, uh, showed me how, how deep you can go with writing alternative text and full descriptions. So I think that's a really nice way feeding back with the team, especially the learning designers might encounter lots of complex images for which they're not the subject matter experts and needing to understand good approaches to working with, with those subject matter experts to write that really uh, good, relevant, contextual um, alternative text. I see Leon. One more there, Matt, Leon. Yes, I think you just picked that one up. Um, I'll let you read that out. Yes. Leon's one. <laughs> So as a member of staff with a particular interest in digital accessibility, I will keep learning about how to make everything available accessible to all in order to allow anybody to access any information and or material. And then with my team, we will work together to increase our ability to learn about and further recognise the needs that exist, especially those which are not being addressed. So yeah, another good one. Thank you very much, Leon. Yeah, thank right. you, Leon. Right, we're going to um, continue with the presentation, but don't worry, we'll have further discussion opportunities uh, after this next chunk. So I think Tamsin, I'm continuing from here. So, um, okay, so now we've got some more examples of objectives at the general awareness level, separated by role type. Now these are just high level, on this and the following slides, and we're just showing the starting point, which is why each line ends with and dot, dot, dot. So for everyone, we have a basic level training course. We don't want people just to complete it, but to reflect on what they learn and discuss it in a team meeting or with a colleague, and perhaps reflect three months later on how what they learned affected their day-to-day -day work. And developers, uh, our, in our IT department, are expected to have knowledge of modern HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and its impact on accessibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's in their roles, person specification. So they should be starting at a higher level already. There's a useful tutorial on Teach Access that we showed you earlier to refresh the basics. We might want them to reflect on their experiences already from having that knowledge perhaps in the form of a presentation. It doesn't have to be a good experience. We can learn a lot when things go uh, bad or wrong as well. 
For support specialists, it's important that they understand to what extent the services they support meet accessibility guidelines, because they tend to be the service owners. So understanding VPATs, accessibility roadmaps and statements is a good start, especially replicating errors or validating the truthfulness of these statements, because would you believe sometimes the VPATs are not 100% accurate? And just doing these exercises is likely to lead to discoveries that can be fed back within the support team and to the vendor, be they internal, like we internally develop something, or external, we as a commercial solution. Here's some level two examples, again at that high level of detail. Here we're at the discovering stage. At the generalist level, uh, we want people to become confident using accessibility checking features in Office and resolving defects in content. For developers, we want them to go a bit deeper into testing, starting with the W3C's quick checks. It can also be useful not only to learn about some success criteria from the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, but you can get a deeper understanding by studying the sufficient techniques. And those are examples of how to meet certain success criteria provided by the W3C in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So we might then ask, for them to give a demonstration or presentation to colleagues at a team meeting and then lead a discussion. And support specialists could start reviewing their support guides and documentation and revising those for accessibility. For example, using semantic ordered lists for step-by-step -step and using select rather than click within written instructions. Commercial off-the-shelf services with VPAT should then help make writing accessibility statements fairly straightforward. And again, they should be feeding back lessons to their teams and feeding forwards to vendors and so on. And here's a light overview of some level three, exploring objectives. We might ask generalists to reflect on their own working practices and behaviors and look for how small changes may result in more accessible or inclusive outcomes. We might also ask developers or support specialists to work with staff or students with disabilities, observe how they use the services for which they are responsible and talk through potential improvements or promote how assistive technology works with a university service. Most of our support specialists have never tried to use a service that they own with a keyboard or screen reader. And still, all these are high levels just to give you an idea. And obviously these are not written out smart objectives. At the final level, we're looking for people to share their lessons, good or bad, with the wider department or external audiences. Building up that organizational culture, pair programming, where a developer with more accessibility experience works with another developer, can be a good way to work through those accessibility puzzles that I'm sure we've all encountered uh, in our time. And building on partnership, support specialists by this point should be building a close working relationship with staff and student groups. And pair programming has been, reckoned by, has been recommended by Mark Stedman, who is the Principal Accessibility Engineer at Fidelity Investments. Last year, he tweeted that he found, as an accessibility consultant, that sitting with developers and creating a component together is a great approach and learning opportunity. And by the way, make sure to read his award-winning posts on the Dev.2 website. So in terms of progress, we have a first draft for about two thirds of the initial content we planned. And we're slowly working our way to completing that final third of the first draft. But this is all gonna to need to be reviewed and quality checked, then confidence checked with a wider circle of colleagues. Assuming we could get the go ahead, we'll then publish internally and begin raising awareness. Hopefully we'll get lots of feedback and ideas for next steps so we can monitor progress and iterate further. So as you can imagine, it has been a challenge. Um, after an initial sprint of activity, our pace has slowed because writing objectives is hard. Um, we also don't know for sure whether there will be take up, um, but we think that since writing objectives is hard, if we can give line managers some quick wins, then these might be popular. We're not sure yet how we can objectively measure take up and outcomes. Um, obviously appraisals are confidential between a direct report and their line manager. Um, we're also going to be talking more to our disability staff network and student groups to ask for feedback on these ideas. We're particularly concerned to get buy-in from them and not end up with our colleagues randomly asking the same groups of people for similar feedback. On the plus side, we'll be sharing a 
next a draft of the work that we've done so far and once we're complete we're going to be sharing this work through Creative Commons to the accessibility community. We've had a couple of managers in our department who are already showing interest and accessibility contacts we've spoken to so far all see a lot of potential in this concept. So what's next? Well, we've written the first drafts of almost 40 objectives so far. We've made them available as a Google Doc, so you're welcome to download it, view it, add comments, make edits or make some suggestions. But please keep in mind it's still an early draft and a lot more effort is needed to make these of acceptable quality in terms of them being smart and in confidence checking that they should achieve the desired outcomes. Um, we think a document probably isn't the best vehicle for this information, um, but when we make it more widely available, we expect to share it on GitHub with a Creative Commons license. So why not develop your idea from earlier? We obviously saw a lot of those in the chat and consider writing it up into a smart objective and adding it to this document. So thank you very much for listening to Matt and I today. We're happy to open up now for any discussion.